Welcome to the Locked On Grizzlies podcast. My name is Sean Coleman. Certainly hope wherever you are and we're having a wonderful start to your day. My name is Sean Coleman and I am welcome, glad to welcome from The Athletic, Joe Varden has been kind enough to join us today. Joe, how are you doing today, sir? Doing just fine. Had some good barbecue here in Atlanta and uh, happy to be on the show. Now, I've got to ask real quickly, you said that you had some good barbecue in Atlanta. Are we going to suggest that the barbecue in Atlanta may be better than the barbecue in Memphis? Or, or from your experience, how would you rank the barbecues uh, at the different places that you've been? No, 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 no. Let's, and this is not just because I'm on uh, the Grizzly, a Grizzly-centric podcast. Um, for, for an, from an outsider's perspective, when you come to downtown Memphis, to me, the whole town smells like barbecue. And uh, it had been a while uh, since I had been there um, prior to earlier this month. And I went straight to Rendezvous. Um, I also go to Gus's Chicken. Uh, that's something that I have to do every time that I'm there. So, uh, no, I would not put Atlanta barbecue over Memphis barbecue, not for a second. Um, but I'm just saying I did have a nice half rack of ribs today, so I feel pretty good about it. Well, I'll at least, you know, give you compliments because you are a barbecue fan such as myself. So I will at least admire you there. Welcome to the Locked on Grizzlies podcast. Obviously, you can find the podcast wherever it's available, Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. And obviously on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button below. But we are here today because Mr. Varden came out with a piece today that gave great deal on the Memphis Grizzlies, a team that is looking to transition from being a rebuilding team to hopefully being a sustainable winner and a playoff team. And Joe, I think it is awesome that you're in Atlanta, I believe covering both Trey and the Hawks and Luca and the Mavericks tonight. That's the level the Grizzlies are trying to get to. And of course, we want to spend a few minutes talking with you about that. Joe, you go into detail talking about John ja Morant, talking about Jaron Jackson Jr., but want to start with John ja Morant. Just there's a new we're talking about the golden age of point guards, Chris Paul, Damian Lillard, all the Steph Curry, all these guys. But I think one thing that definitely is great, there's a young generation of point guards coming into play as well. You're seeing two of them tonight. Jaw's in that group, but in the time that you spent with Jaw for this piece, what stands out about him that is maybe different from other young stars that puts him in that upper tier of young stars in the league in your opinion? Well, there are a couple of things. I mean, one, the sheer athleticism. Um, you know, Trey Young can't do what Ja does. Luca can't do it. Um, the older guys like Steph, like he can't do it. Um, Damian is closer, but Damian's game is different as well. And, and, and Ja's just ability to attack the rim, regardless of who is standing in front of him, despite being six, three and a buck 75, that is what has catapulted him into what we consider to be an NBA star because of the kind of just buzz that he generates regardless of um, whether or not the Grizzlies are winning. Now, what has happened, of course, since Ja showed up here is they started winning. You know, I mean, almost right away, they went from a pretty bad rebuilding team in a small market, which that comes with all kinds of, of challenges to they had lost 109 games in the previous two years, um, I think, or, or something like that. Maybe it was the pre previous three years, whatever it was. It's a ton of, ton of losses. And he shows up, and not only is he rocking the rim and jumping over Kevin Love and jumping over whoever, um, the Grizzlies are getting into the play-in round, and then last year they win the play-in round and give the Utah a run for its money. So you have a dynamic, unafraid, headstrong, but yet down home, like connected to Memphis, 22-year-old who has almost single-handedly led this franchise out of the first rebuilding phrase. Like they, I wrote it in the piece, they went, they almost immediately went from bad to respectable. And that's, that first step is hard to take. It really is. And then that first step for them has certainly been successful. You hinted at it very well, how, how kind of out of the blue. Taylor Jenkins, and we'll get to him in a second, your your experiences with him. The combination of him and Jaw have came in and immediately exceeded expectations. It took about six weeks 
But when they finally were able to get it on the right path, they made the most of it and turned into a team that changed the you know perception of Memphis around the NBA. Focused on the three, focused on high offensive efficiency and playing defense as well. The other big key, and obviously something that you know is possibly in the back of many a Grizzlies fans' minds, is we've never had a talent like Jaw. So there's always the future to consider. And we've seen over the past 72 hours, LaMelo Ball come out from Charlotte talking about really leaving's not, you know, in his DNA. And obviously this piece from you today is one of the better glimpses we've got of that mindset for Jaw. Speaking of a Damian Lillard, someone who stayed in Portland and others like that, do you get that perception? There certainly is a key, but there's a key connection between Jaw and Memphis that stands out and kind of fuels how good he's been so far. Well, not to to self promote, but I was fortunate enough to have uh, like I'm the one who actually wrote that Lamelo feels that way as well. It was in a separate piece, a separate interview. But they, it's kind of funny, and I will answer your question because um, it's a good one. But I I actually see a bunch of similarities between Lamelo Ball and Charlotte and John Morant in Memphis, even though they come from entirely different backgrounds. But you're talking about young. Uh, franchise changing point guards who win rookie of the year with high levels of athleticism and who also um, seem to kind of really grasp that idea of family. Um, and, and maybe you wonder how LaMelo gets that given the, the latter portion of his childhood. Um, but in Jaws case, like He's from Dalzell, South Carolina. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's a town of about 2,200 people. And you, when you think about Memphis, it's the smallest market in the NBA. And, you know, yes, life is much better for John now. He's got a lot more money. His family moved up from Dalzell with him. Um, but he, he, they see a lot of the cultural connections between where they're from and where they live now. And they they really welcome that. And I think that's an important component. I mean, you can never say, you never say never, you don't know how somebody's going to feel five years from now, eight years from now, but you in John ja Morant. And also by the way, LaMelo ball in Charlotte is you have these budding superstars who do not seem to have their eye on the bigger market. And you mentioned Damian Lillard. That's, a great win for Portland. And now he's obviously much more advanced in his career, but you know, I was with him all summer for team USA and in, in Tokyo and everything. And there were a number of times where we were talking to him about maybe getting out of Portland. And I was really happy to see him say, um, I'm actually not, we're stopping this. I'm not going anywhere. Um, and that's good. I think, I think that's good for the league that we have some of this, you know, free agency can be a wonderful thing. It certainly can be. And players are certainly within their right to exercise that free agency and go where they want. But what we're getting now is this in this age where players sign these lucrative extensions. And then as little as one year later, one year, um, now they're talking about pushing their way out. And, you know, you see it now with Ben Simmons, um, Damien could have done that. He has a bunch of years left on his deal. I'm glad he pulled back. Um, you know, even Zion Williamson in, in New Orleans, who is uh, Jaws' age, he was drafted ahead of him. And he's, you know, we I had written in the past that his family isn't happy in New Orleans and there's whispers there. And that's tough for the league. And so you really want to feel good about the Grizzlies right now in the future because of how connected Ja seems to be not only to the team, but, but to the community at large. And we always wonder about that connection between the star player and every facet of the franchise. And Ja mentioned that multiple times in your article, how he's aware of how the front office has not only made it clear he is the star, he's the leader of this franchise, how much effort they're putting into creating a winner. You see all the turmoil other places. You mentioned Zion, Luca in Dallas, what's work, you know, their front offices that have not worked out. But that seems to be a key. The connection between John and Memphis certainly stands out. But with how good this front office has been so far, that certainly, as long as that's in place, that certainly is also a great thing for, you know, keeping Jaw and keeping the Grizzlies' hopes of becoming an eventual contender alive. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and um, you know, Taylor Jenkins is 37 years old. 
he was hired, I think, what was it, eight days before they drafted Jaw, something like that. Uh, Zach Kleiman, you know, he's been on the job a little bit longer than Taylor, but not much. And sort of the three of them are going to be connected, you know, I think GM, coach, and player. And, and then now you add Jaron Jackson, who actually was drafted sort of by the previous regime, but in committing the money that they committed to, to Jaron, who is close with Ja and, and Ja wanted him here. I mean, that says to the, to the NBA at large, like we have decided on our path and it is with these two. Um, and we are committed to Jaron, even with his injury history and whatever unknowns we may have. And I think, I th- continuity is good in professional sports, the NFL, major league, whatever continuity is a good thing. And Memphis being the small market that it is knowing the challenges that it has to go out and get the type of player that Jock could become, or even a Jaron Jackson could become and free agency is difficult. And so you build this way. Um, Jaron needs to be, he needs to take a step forward for this team to reach its potential, but, you know, it's, it's nice to see that the Grizzlies have, have made that bet. Again, we're here with Joe Varden of The Athletic. Again, wrote a wonderful piece today for The Athletic. You know, he's talked about the fact that he has looked a lot into the younger stars in the game. Recently, writing pieces on LaMelo Ball. Now, Joe, <laughs> LaMelo Ball, now John Morant. You can find him at Joe Varden on Twitter. Um, also want to remind our folk listening, you know, we want to talk about connections with the community. McDonald's, one of our title sponsors, has been one of the best places since 1965 to connect with friends, family. Before Grizzlies game, go check it out. Go enjoy McDonald's. And there's a reason why their slogan is, I'm loving it, for a matter of the food that they make or just being able to connect with everybody that you know there. It's a place that you'll certainly love each time you get to enjoy it. So, Joe, we've talked about Jaw. It's clear he is the, the centerpiece of what the Grizzlies are trying to create here. But everybody knows they're going to make the max commitment to him next summer without hesitation. Another key part of that future is now in place for the future in Jaron Jackson Jr. But it wasn't as clear with him as it was with John ja Morant. Your thoughts on the contract extension, maybe some thoughts from NBA circles. The talent is certainly there, but how likely is it that this contract will become a bargain rather than a burden, depending on Jaron's health? That certainly seems to be the bigger question for the Grizzlies' future. Yeah, there's two ways. So one, there's um, there's an injury protection in the deal. So and and we don't know exactly what the injury prote- protection is, but we can wisely and reasonably assume it has to do with Jaron's left knee where if something else bad happens to it, like if it's not as structurally sound as maybe we're, we think that it is now and, and he suffers another injury there, like the, the Grizzlies are protected in that case. So I think that's a good thing. That's a good start. Um, and then the second thing is that the total value of the deal and then also the payments and so, so in the outer years um, as the, the deal goes along are team friendly. Um, so they didn't break the bank to sign him, uh, but they gave him, uh, you know, obviously generational security fi- financially, um, and also paid him probably a little bit above scale given how few games he's played over three years. So that's great for him, but this is not the kind of contract necessarily that will hamstring you. Um, I guess the way that it does is if he flattens out if he doesn't become like he's you know I don't think he's ever averaged more I don't even know if he's ever averaged five rebounds in an NBA season but it's certainly for the position he plays he needs to do a better job on the glass if he doesn't if he doesn't progress there and if he doesn't improve like he's been a reasonable scorer throughout his short NBA career um, but if he doesn't become more versatile as a shooter now and also a little bit better with his back to the basket. That will saddle this team because, you know, trade value becomes a little bit more questionable. And also then, you know, you paid him as a franchise cornerstone and he didn't get better. Um, They're betting that that's not the case. And then in the meantime, you know, assuming that his trade value holds, uh, if they needed to trade the contract, they could. And uh, like I said, um, despite his injury history, there are some protections there. 
And of course, the other thing that stands out is, is as you have mentioned, I've talked about it a bit on the Locked on Grizzlies podcast. Many places have mentioned it. You know, John Oran's been here for two years. Jaron Jackson Jr. is now entering his fourth. But these two players have yet to play a full regular season's worth of games together. Um, I, I believe you had mentioned 70. That's about where I'd calculated it. But this summer, we had gotten hints of the connection there. It's always been clear they had, they had a good relationship. But they made it a point to bring their games together as much as possible to try to make that combination as good. How important is that relationship between Ja and Jaron to their future working out the way that we hope it all will in time? Hmm. I think, I mean, that's a good question. And I don't want to overstate that. I mean, I, I think you want harmony. I don't think you have to be best friends. It seems that, that Ja really goes to bat for and likes Jaron Jackson. Uh, Jaron certainly seems to respect Ja. There's no doubt about it. And it's good that they were able to get on the same page like they did not only um, in Las Vegas where the Grizzly summer team was like that, that happens like oftentimes, um, especially the last, over the last few years, everybody goes to summer league in terms of the, the kids that are trying to make those teams. But then the, the actual, the real players join them and they practice on the side. They have runs afterwards and Jaron and job were able to do that. So that's nice. But then the two of them met up in L.A. and got involved in runs day in and day out with a bunch of other NBA NBA talent. You know, Aaron Gordon, Ben Simmons, uh, JaVale McGee, Brandon Clark, actually, from from the Grizzlies was there as well. Jordan Clarkson, my my uh, my pal from, uh, you know, the Cleveland days. Now he's out at uh, with Utah. And on and on. So, so all this NBA talent is there, and John and Jaron are are playing in these runs together, and they're really just trying to learn each other's games more than they already did. And I I I like that. I do. Um, you know, I guess like you, they could transform into a better one four or one five, whatever you want to say. Jaron is pick and roll game, um, but but at the same time, like it's not that they didn't know each other. It's not that they didn't know each other's games beforehand because regardless of the injury history, like they still have practiced together. They've played 70 games or whatever. So this is more about just kind of showing each other that commitment and that respect to be able to do something like this. And, you know, it, that can't hurt. It, it, it can't. But this is, you know, Ja needs to continue to lead this team and Jaron has to live up to the money that he just got. That Those are the keys for the Grizzlies. And this is a key season in that development between them growing. Like you said, they don't have to be best friends. They're, they they may not have the relationship that, a, you know, Jaron Jackson Jr. and Xavier Tillman do where they were, you know, Jaron was in Xavier Tillman's wedding. But that chemistry on the court certainly is something that definitely will go the right way. And this year is a key to that. You had mentioned, though, the Grizzlies made the commitment. There's still a certainty that has to be gained in exactly what they have in Jaron Jackson Jr. And it seems like we talk about Jaron being these most improved player conversations. That's a big key for Memphis. What exactly do they have and how consistently will they know that they have it? It seems that's one of the biggest, if not the biggest narratives for the Grizzlies present and future this season when it comes to Jaron Jackson Jr. There's no question. And and I think, I mean, had he not gotten the extension, now you're actually looking at controversy and pressure. Is Jaron worth resigning is this the direction that the grizzlies want to go so they took those two questions out of it by giving him the money up front and now you're absolutely right it's paramount to 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 grizzly success is how good can he be because if you look at him we start go back to the top what we were saying at the top of this of, of our conversation and also what's in the piece is that john morant basically dragged this franchise from bad to respectable respectable but respectable doesn't get you much right like they 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 want to be contenders they they want to be a team that can make that deep playoff run i don't know how they do that without jaron jackson like he like he's like ja has taken them so far otherwise this is a roster of role players um young guys uh not too many veterans, actually. You know, I mean, they, they traded away Valanchunas. You know, Steven Adams is here now, but he figures to play 
less of an offensive role than Valanchunas did, which he, which means even more for Jaron. So, yeah, if if they want to be a team that doesn't have to worry about the plan, and they want to be a team that makes that fifth seed and maybe wins a playoff series, you know, and then eventually becomes the kind of market where a free agent might want to come and play with these two guys. Like they have to be like you, this is a stars league. So that is what Jaron, Jaron Jackson has in front of him this year. And the hope is certainly there that he will do that. Before we get into a bit of the future with Joe, do want to remind you that a title, another title sponsor of the show is Built Bar. Go to Built.com, put in the promo code LOCKED15. Make Built Bar a part of your day. Have it in the morning for breakfast and the afternoon as a snack. Use the promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next order from Built Bar with over 18 different flavors to choose from. Speaking of different options that are out there. There are so many different options that the Grizzlies can go when it comes to building for their future. But besides Jaw and Jaron, uh, Joe, you mentioned that um, Taylor Jenkins, you talked with him, 37 years old, kind of an unknown when the Grizzlies hired him two years ago, right at the same time that John Morant did. I feel like he has certainly exceeded expectations himself. This year, we're hoping to certainly find out he's not just perfect for this rebuild. He's the long-term guy to lead us to contention. From time with him and NBA circles, thoughts about him. What are your thoughts? Is Taylor Jenkins certainly the guy? He seems to certainly check all the boxes so far that can lead this team to where it ultimately wants to go as a championship contender. As uh, that Taylor is like the consummate teacher. He is always teaching, and I mean, fast forward to um, during the preseason when I was working on this story and, and Memphis is actually one of the few arenas where you still sit on the floor. And so we're on the floor and I am picking up things from him that I had seen ad nauseum in the bubble, like Jaron Jackson, he gets the ball, like at the top of the key, takes two dribbles and then he stops and he freezes and he ends up, he gives it back to John and they reset. And uh, they run back down the floor. It's a, there's a transition situation. And Taylor is still saying to, to Jaron, hey, he backed off of you 10 feet. You take one more dribble and take the shot. He's giving that direction in game. And so I really think that that is who Taylor Jenkins is as a coach. He's not going to get caught up in sort of the hustle and bustle of, of, of like, um, you know, the, of NBA social circles and NBA pressure. Like, I think he is in this to kind of build through teaching. Um, and I just, I've seen it up close and personal so many times. Um, you know, you, you don't know how this is going to turn out and you don't know, you know, we know what happens in this league if you have a year or two that are down. So like, I'm not, I'm not one to say if Taylor is going to be the right guy for this, but I can just say he's, he's been going about it the right way and he absolutely has not changed his approach given now that there are ex some expectation on, on his team. And we talk about places like Miami. We talk about places like Toronto, other places like that, Utah that are so good at development. I'm not saying that Memphis has that track record yet, but with Zach Kleiman's success record over the past two years, what uh, Taylor Jenkins has done to help add value, you know, tap, you know, get it some untapped value out of veterans and young players alike. That's the goal for Memphis to really get that sustainable winning that they want to. And I'd say they're off to a heck of a good start. That goes to the teaching that you're talking about with Taylor Jenkins and something that's going to have to be there for them to ultimately be that contender. Would you think? I, yeah. I mean, yeah, I would think so. And I think, I think there's another way to look at this is um, playoff basketball. It's a cliche to say this, but it's so much different than the regular season. And so much of it has to do with attention to detail. And the, you talk to the Grizzlies individually and they talk about as players um, how different that was for them to, to where the, the attention to detail matters. And um, so now in this training camp, the things that they were starting to be taught during the playoffs, the, the ultra, you know, the hypersensitivity to detail, uh, Stephen Adams told me that that is still happening now in training camp. And he's saying that the, the, that the kinds of things that Taylor and his staff are going over are things that were learned in the postseason, but that on veteran teams you might not hear as much during the regular season. But they're, they're drilling that down now. And what Steven had said was, 
is that he was he was impressed that the young players seemed to be open to that kind of teaching in October, having experienced that the playoffs don't even start till, till April, and so that that the fact that they are comfortable and eager to learn this kind of thing because of their experience last year should bode well long term, and so that's another seemingly good thing for for Taylor. And so, Joe, we, we, we have obviously this insight. And again, thank you. I mentioned to you before the show how awesome it was to see the incredible detail that you gave us. It was a very, very wonderful piece of work. So thank you for that. Not something we often see here in Memphis, at least on the national stage. But I'll ask this a different way. We see small market teams that can take different ways to becoming a contender. You've got the guy who turns into an uber historic superstar like a Giannis. You've got the Toronto Raptors, if you want to call Toronto a small market, who trade for that Uber guy in Kawhi Leonard. You've got the Utah Jazz, who build just an absolutely deep quality team. I don't know which route the Grizzlies can go to potentially become a contender, but I do think that there are multiple routes they can take to eventually become that contender. Would you agree with that? And I think that's a good position to be in as a young team, as long as that connection between star player and jaw coach in front office remains yeah i mean first of all i agree and then secondly i mean i i'm i would suggest that the grizzlies route is most similar to utah i would think um you know you look at quinn snyder you look at donovan mitchell and rudy gobert you know that's kind of sort of the same the same triangle that you're starting to see here in in memphis and then they have just added pieces via trades um, you know, a Jordan Clarkson, uh, a Bogdanovich, um, you know, Joe Ingles, like he's been there forever, like that kind of thing. Um, it's a team largely built that way, you know, because the free agents just aren't looking to come there. You know, I think that is the Memphis model. I mean, you talk about Memphis, there was so much upheaval early in Giannis's career and you didn't even know what Giannis was. I mean, he was, Drafted, I think, 15th overall. Uh, Middleton, same thing. You know, these are kind of like middle of the road guys. You didn't know what you had in them. They switched coaches. Um, and then all of a sudden, Giannis becomes Giannis. Uh, Budenholzer unlocks Chris Middleton and they kind of take off from there. Now they are this like sort of pillar of stability. Um, but they weren't always that way. Like you think about Cleveland, um, that the best player ever or second best player ever just happened to be born in Akron and, and wanted to come home and change the whole thing. They, they were terrible while LeBron was gone. Um, so Memphis, that's not who Memphis is. I think Memphis is more the Utah model. Um, and they definitely seem to be from a front office perspective. Let's stay under the radar. Let's keep our cap flexibility. Let's uh, you know, role players who we can extend if we need them to, or we can replace and upgrade and let's not let, let's take our time with this and build ourselves into something that's consistent. I think, I think that's what you're, what you're seeing them try to do. Joe, this was a great time. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. And I'll ask just one other quick question. Number one, what can folks expect from you as the season starts? Always great work coming from you. I know you're at one of the marquee matchups to start the season tonight with Trey versus Luca. First off, how excited are you to see the influx of young talent that's come in this league with having covered LaMelo, Ja, now seeing Trey and Luca? How excited are you and should NBA fans be for the next five to 10 years as some historic Talents continue to age, but we've got so much young talent in the league. And also, where can folks find your work and anything they can be expecting coming up, you know, in the coming weeks and months as the season starts? Well, I mean, first of all, like you said, my Twitter handle is at Joe Varden. I tweet all of my stories at The Athletic. Uh, and please, um, you can go to theathletic.com. And, and for one simple price, you get access to every article about every team that we cover all over the world whether you're a European football fan or an NCAA football fan or baseball, whatever, we cover it all. Um, and we appreciate your business. Um, I want to start with your question about the, uh, the influx of talent. Um, like my first, um, like I, one of my first job for full-time job, almost 20 years, pretty much 20 years ago 
is I was covering the Cavs for a chain of small newspapers in Northeast Ohio. So I did that for two years. It was LeBron's first two years. And then uh, I moved on and have had a, you know, just kind of a winding path. But this is my eighth consecutive season back in the NBA. And the first four of it, I, I spent as the, the beat writer in Cleveland at the Plain Dealer. And, and so, so much of my NBA experience was LeBron and Kyrie and then the Golden State Warriors, you know, like th that was the dominant story for so long. And so for me, having this new influx of talent is really refreshing. You know, it's almost like a total reset on everything that I've had to experience and learn and see for the first part of my tenure in the NBA. Like it's, it, it's, um, it's, it's like a, a, a new beginning. And so, you know, like I, I personally enjoy watching Ja play and, and LaMelo blows me away with how young he is and, and seemingly like how much he, you think he has to grow as a person, but then you talk to him and he's kind of grounded and then he goes out there and he plays the way he does. And, and like Luka Doncic is, is different than both of those two guys, but he could be the next face of the league maybe, you know? And um, so I've just, I really enjoy that. I, I really enjoy it. I think the kinds of stories that I aim to do this year are really kind of a lot of like what you saw with the, the Memphis story. Like um, I'll still go to some of the big games or, and I'll be in all these cities a bunch of times. Um, but for the last three years at the athletic, my primary job really was to go to the big game and try to get you inside what happened that night. And, uh, and now I'm going to, try to do more of telling you the bigger story about what's going on with an individual or what's going on in a market um, or some kind of theme or trend. And sometimes those stories take longer to do, but that's, that's what I aim to do this year. I can promise you I won't be a stranger in Memphis. That will not be my only trip there. Um, I'm going to be back and uh, just really looking forward to seeing the growth. Well, Joe, as always, for many years, we've looked forward to your perspective, and it's going to be awesome to see it. Obviously, with LeBron in the past and the game's marquee stars, hopefully get to see your perspective as much as possible on some of the future stars, including hopefully more than one here with John Jaron in Absolutely. Memphis. His name is Joe Varden. You can find him at Joe Varden on Twitter. You can find myself at StatsSAC, the show at Locked on Grizz, the podcast, wherever it's available. Subscribe below on YouTube. Joe, if you'll stick with us for just a second after the show, but thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to join us uh, to discuss, you know, players who are all beloved to our hearts uh, here for the Memphis Grizzlies. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. But that's all for Joe Varden. My name's Sean Coleman. We'll talk to you again soon here on the Locked on Grizzlies podcast.